Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Trudy Sanavaratna, Registrar of the College. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here to uh, have what I hope is going to be a really interesting webinar for you all. Thank you for joining. Uh, this is to think about the new Clinical Impact Awards, uh, which are being launched and starting, starting very, very soon uh, next week. In fact, they'll be open from the 27th of April. So I'm also really, really delighted and thanks so much to uh, three colleagues who have joined to share their words of wisdom, wisdom about the, the process because they've taken part in the process previously. So thank you hugely to Professor Nav Aluwalia, to Dr. Kate Lovett and Professor Ashok Roy, who you're going to be hearing from uh, as we go along. Um, so thank you to, to all of you. So please do post lots of questions. We want to really help as many people as possible to apply for this round. Uh, so post lots of questions. If you pop them though in the Q&A function, we'll be able to pick them up uh, and go through them, either respond to them or, or preferably uh, have a really lively Q&A session right at the end. So I'm going to move on to then um, a quick presentation to, to go through the whole process of the awards. So here we are. So the, 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 they are now going to be called the National Clinical Impact Award. So it's a, a slight change following the consultation back in 2021 that happened in the pandemic. Um, these excellence are all, all previously called excellence awards and the national awards have actually uh, been running in the NHS since 1948, since they've started, really to recognize the excellence of clinicians involved. Uh, at, at a national level. So they're really sort of important. And I really want to reiterate that we want to encourage as many people as possible to, to apply this time round. And the college is here to support you. There's really good uh, guidance also that the impact awards and the committees have put out. So why should you apply? So why should you apply? Please don't feel that you're not good enough. And I think um, sometimes many of us, many psychiatrists have imposter syndrome about how much work we're doing. The reality is all of you are doing so much work across the board in all sorts of different areas. So I really want to encourage all of you to consider applying. Think that actually there may be uh, areas of work uh, that you have excelled in, but you've stayed quiet about. Um, the awards are there really to demonstrate that uh, excellence that has been achieved at a national level. So they are national impact awards and uh, the change of the name to impact awards highlights the sort of importance of the impact that, that your work may have had. It's also an opportunity to, to share the work with your peers. It's an opportunity to support your sector and showcase the work that you might have done, whether it's cl clinical, educational, research, and so on. And it's also there to really inspire uh, colleagues to strive for innovation and to think about the benefits that have been brought to um, patient care services, education and research. And so lots and lots of very, very good reasons to apply and not to shy away from them and think perhaps you're not good enough. So who can apply? There are strict sort of guidances around who can apply. Who can apply. So doctors can, of course, so can dentists and GPs. But there are criteria, and forgive me if some of you know this because you'll have applied, but so you have to be, have an NHS contract uh, or an honorary contract and be registered with a GMC license to practice. And in terms of uh, part-time hours, you have to be doing at least three contractual uh, PAs in your, in your job description. So you don't need to be full time. There are some criteria about around not being eligible, and that's if you're not on a consultant pay scale, uh, as expressed in PAs or equivalents, if you're in a locum consultant post, or if you work in a general management role, 
uh, as a psychiatrist and you have no, no specific clinical um, sessions. And if you're not fully registered or don't have a license to practice. All of these are available on the, on the website and on the guidance. There's a, a short guidance and a, a fuller guidance to read. So some of the key changes then. So there's a change in the name for, to a clinical impact award. I think importantly, the numbers of awards have gone up. So the consultation um, advised around numbers of awards. So they have gone up in England from 300 to 600. So there is a, a much bigger opportunity that you might uh, be awarded one. Uh, and 37 in Wales. And just I didn't say at the beginning, but these awards are, are for England and Wales at the moment. So this isn't a, a UK wide offer, it's England and Wales. The level of awards have also changed from a bronze, silver, gold and platinum to three new levels. So national one, two and three. And in Wales, it's from zero to um, three. Other changes are that applicants, you don't have to choose which level you want to apply for. You just make your single application and the scoring committee based on the score will decide which award um, you might be, might be offered. And those are the, the pay scales that have been looked at. There are, they are different to previous um, award levels. And so that's something to think about. And in terms of the split between um, national one to three, it's loaded towards national one, uh, which is the first level, but still plenty of opportunity. Other changes are the new domains, which are slightly different. The scoring is still the zero to 10, which I'll quickly show in a second. But those are the five categories, um, which mirror in a way the previous categories, but are slightly different. Uh, and the fifth new category, an additional national impact is a is a, is a specific area which can allow you to sort of uh, come up with or describe um, specific areas that aren't covered in, in the other areas. And hopefully with all the speakers in our Q&A, we'll go through um, how to make an application as impactful uh, as possible. So the scoring is a zero to 10. Uh, as you can see, the 10 is for you know, real excellence at a national level. Six is for working you know, above and beyond and contributing perhaps more at a regional level. Two is pretty much key, uh, meeting the terms of your contractual agreement within the local area. And zero is uh, not really meeting uh, those levels. But hopefully not many people will, will be scoring a zero uh, going on to the um, application process. Um, but you know, the, the, the scoring process is really rigorous. Um, and it's good to know how to sort of move things in, you know, higher into your scoring system. But again, we'll go through that hopefully. So other changes quickly is that uh, there are no more renewals. Um, so people will be awarded um, a level for five years and then candidates will have to reapply for that. Um, the single level application I've mentioned already, uh, and that's quite important, I think, to remember so that you, you know, one advantage of that is that people may, um, depending on the score, move to a much higher level uh, rather than just to the, the initial level, depending on where the, the scoring is. If you're less than full time, uh, the awards will no longer be prorated uh, and, and also the awards are no longer pensionable. And that may well be important if you're uh, already holding awards from previous, so that's something to think about. Applicants can only have support from one national uh, organisation, that would be the college, um, and employers also need to indicate their support um, by providing uh, a citation or, or lack of, but hopefully, again, there will be support for that. And these are just some key dates to think about and for you to know um, as you move through the process, it will be concluding over the next couple of months. Uh, so the portals are all, all going to be open next week on the 27th of April up to the 22nd of June. Um, then you need to start doing your applications, getting local approval uh, and getting it into the college, please, by the 11th of May, which is the closing day to receive the applications with us at the college. There will then be a whole college process. Uh, and on the 16th of June, um, 
applicants will be informed of the outcome uh, from the college process and uh, those that have been given support will be given encouragement to make the online application which you have to do by the 22nd of June. And then of course, and there's the whole uh, IKEA process that happens and um, people will be informed probably towards the end of January uh, next year. And there is you know, an appeals process if people are wanting to appeal that process. So uh, that's, those are the important deadlines. Um, just also for you to know that uh, the process uh, through the college is very rigorous uh, and they are blind rated uh, through the college processes. So those rating uh, each other uh, won't know who, who the applicants are through the process. So I think that's an important step um, that the college is also making to be as fair as possible. And just, I'm gonna stop there and just really have, have these words in front of you, which is we want as many of you to feel that you're able to apply. Um, you know, we want as many of you from all different backgrounds. We want more women to apply. Traditionally, we haven't as had, had as many women coming forward for this. And we want uh, you to be nudging each other to apply for these and, and think of it as a real opportunity. We know that uh, we don't have enough psychiatrists uh, applying for these awards traditionally so hopefully this will be a, a different opportunity and a different year to do that so let me stop sharing there um, so that's all I wanted to say really to to to, to get us started there's much more information uh, on the actual website that you can read but those are the key nuggets really for you to uh, hold on to so on that, can I invite uh, Nav, please? So Professor Nav Aluwalia onto the stage. Wonderful, Nav, I can see you. So thank you so much. So Professor Nav Aluwalia, who works at the Rotherham, Doncaster and South Humber NHS Foundation Trust. He's been a doctor for 30 years. He's a consultant in substance misuse for 20 years or just over 20 years. He, he's only just stepped down last month after 10 years as the Executive Medical Director and the Director of Research at his trust. He's Honorary Professor at the Sheffield Hallam University, and he's been on the Yorkshire and Humber National CA Committee for the last 12 years, and he's now the Medical Vice Chair. So really helpful that you're, you've had all of those roles now so thank you so much thank you for everything you've done as well and your expertise and um, so i look forward to hearing what you have to tell us over to you now thank you thank you very much trudy and i see truly we've got 107 participants and that's really good news hopefully each of you can spread the the good news about how this is a much more egalitarian and fair scheme in my personal opinion than the previous one and we should be encouraging all psychiatrists to consider applying some of them will choose not to that's absolutely fine but considering applying is actually the biggest battle and once you've overcome that battle i'm sure more applications will come through so i'm going to talk a little bit about myself and then i'm going to talk about some of the top tips that i'm going to advise you to consider uh, they are all my personal opinions this is not official uh, college guidance it's not official uh, advisory committee guidance on a national level. This is my personal opinion. Uh, you can accept all my opinions, you can reject them all or anything in between. It's entirely up to your good selves. Start then with a few bits about me. Um, so I think it's really important to understand what the committee's structures are about because that will help you target your audience. In my experience, one of the key failings is that applicants don't consider the target audience. When you apply, a committee will look at that. And that committee consists of half of the committee as doctors. Most of them are not psychiatrists, remember. The majority of them will be hospital doctors from the acute sector, surgeons, radiologists, pathologists, medics. One quarter will be regarded as employer reps, and that can be for example, chief executives, chief operating officers, but it can also be medical directors. So it can be doctors who have a managerial role. Then one quarter will be lay practitioners. 
from our communities. This could be, for example, magistrates, it could be ex-teachers, headmasters. They usually have a good understanding of the NHS though, and they're usually um, very successful individuals in their own right. And that's really important. In other words, you are not sending an application in for the Royal College of Psychiatrists. You're sending an application in to be marked by people who probably know very little about mental health. I want to just emphasize that again. The people who look at your forms are not going to be psychiatrists and don't know that much about mental health. So the first challenge you will have is to make sure that you educate them to a degree about what you do. The second bit is that I've marked now probably about over 1500 national applications. And you do start to see some trends appearing in terms of applications that are good and successful and applications that are poor. Uh, it's not always easy to spot the brilliant ones or the poor ones, but on the whole, once you've done a few hundred or a few thousand, you start to get a little bit better at it. And I've done it now for 12 years. But this is going to be the next bit, just about my personal view of some top 10, top five tips. The first is, um, presume you're going to fail. Uh, and I don't mean that to make you depressed or, or miserable. I do it because it's a matter of fact. The majority of people who apply for either a local or a national award don't get it or don't get it that year. And yet the number of times I've seen people who feel really quite hurt by failure, not true. You've got to start to presume that you're not going to get one and then be surprised if you do get one. And that's re a really important lesson. When I've applied for awards, about two thirds of the time in my life, either local awards or national awards, I've been successful. But I remember the times when I failed. And when I first failed, it really gets to you. You wonder whether you've done a bad job. Once you failed a few times, actually, it's quite easy. So please get into the mindset of not seeing this is a, uh, a test of your personality or character. It's a cash award. It's not about whether you're a good doctor. It's all about the money. Many good doctors don't have any clinical excellence awards or clinical impact awards, as they're going to be called, at all. Really important. The second bit is that um, you've got to keep looking at your target audience in terms of what they're looking for. And do you remember I told you about the makeup of the, of the committees? They're gone, going to want to look at impact and they're going to be wanting to try and understand why psychiatry is different from the other branches of healthcare. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, we don't have very good diagnostic categories and therefore our treatments are, lack the precision of acute medicine. And that's just a fact of life. It's one of the beauties of being in psychiatry, but unfortunately, it doesn't necessarily endear you to psychiatrists, um, sorry, to surgeons and medics. So we've got to try and sharpen up what we do in terms of our applications to we look as if we are more focused on particular conditions and outcomes. The second thing is that um, we often complain in mental health that we don't have very good outcome measures and therefore we can't compare with say surgical teams or medical teams. My view of that is that that's just tough. The awards are there to look at impact so we all work hard, we all do lots of stuff, but they're entitled to say, you've done all that stuff now, so what? What can you show that demonstrates that you made a meaningful difference to patients, carers, or our communities? So keep focusing on impact. And then my final bit here, um, Trudy, before I uh, hand on to, to Kate and the others, uh, my personal tips for success. The first is, that medics love jargon, psychiatrists love jargon, but much of what, say, a surgeon will talk about or a medic, their jargon is in the lay public's imagination. Things like DVT, okay, surgical outcomes after, for example, a transplant. The lay public get some of that. They don't necessarily get our jargon. So if you Introduce jargon, explain what it means, don't use abbreviations. The second bit is, and I, and I hate to be um, mean about this, 
Do you remember when you first told people who were not psychiatrists that you wanted to do psychiatry? And I bet many of them thought, oh dear, what a waste of time, a bit wishy-washy. It's all a bit jargony and it's all a bit handholdy. Well, you presume that's what they're going to say when they read your application. And then make sure your application is tighter as a consequence of that, so that you don't look as if you are their stereotype. And if you are their stereotype, change the wording of your application. Yeah, this is not about psychiatry promotion. This is about making sure we win awards. The next bit is that um, it's very tempting to pad out your application. And my view is that that simply dilutes your achievements. I would rather see three really good bullet points than 10 completely pointless insertions into an application domain. So I'd rather have more narrative about three points that made a difference than just a list of stuff where I've got no idea what you did and what the impact was. We've talked about encouraging women to apply, absolutely. But we also need to encourage other groups that are perhaps not so well represented in our figures. For example, uh, those who come from uh, ethnic minority communities or where their degree was uh, obtained overseas, their first medical degree. My mother tongue is Punjabi, but if I had to write a clinical excellence award in Punjabi, I don't think I'd get past first grade at primary school. So what I say to you, if English isn't your first language is, don't be ashamed of that. Be proud of the fact that you may be able to speak two, three, four, even five languages plus. But make sure when you write the application, you pass it to someone whose language is, first language is English, so that they can have a look at it for you. Nothing to be ashamed of there. You're psychiatrist for your brain. You're not psychiatrist for your linguistic ability. The final bit then before I hand over is that Trudy has talked about the new scheme. It really is very different from the old scheme. It may superficially appear to be the same. It's very different. Please read the guidance once and then read it again. Highlight the differences if you're familiar with the old one. Highlight the differences. Because they'll be looking for people who carry on doing things in the old way and you will not get the credit that you need. So make sure you read the guidance and state in the obvious, but in my experience, people haven't read it, haven't read any new guidance for years, and they just keep putting in the same applications year after year. So start again as if this was the very first time you were doing it. And two just very quick points to add on to what Trudy said. There are transitional arrangements in place for existing national award holders. If you are successful for five years, your award will be maintained at at least the same financial level as you had before, and it will be pensionable for those five years. The second bit is unlike the old scheme, you can hold a national award, and at the same time, you can hold local awards. Previously, you would only hold one or the other. Now, you're gonna be able to have both. And that means although the, the national awards don't give you as much money, when you consider that you might also be able to get some clinical boards locally, it should hopefully make you feel better about the, the overall drop in remuneration for the national awards. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you very much for listening. I'll be here for the Q&A. Uh, if you've got any questions about the new scheme or my personal opinion about how we can maximise success, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Take care, everyone. Nav, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, and lots and lots of words of uh, in encouragement, but also po really positive encouragement, lots of words of wisdom, actually, also from um, having um, received these awards and also having been the scorer. Um, so thank you so much. So I can already see lots of questions appearing in the chat, actually, relating to some of what you've said. So let's hold on to those. So Thank you, Nav. Let's go on then to um, our next speaker, uh, who is Dr. Kate Lovett. Uh, so Kate, thank you so much for, for joining us. Kate is our presidential lead for recruitment at the college. Uh, and she is, of course, our immediate past dean at the college too. Um, as presidential lead for recruitment, she's working with members across the college 
to develop an ambitious and comprehensive five-year strategy for recruitment. So Kate, thank you for being with us and over to you to uh, have your words of wisdom too. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Trudy and colleagues, for inviting me to be part of this uh, discussion uh, this afternoon. I have to say that I've always felt really quite ambivalent about Clinical Excellence uh, Award. Um, and I thought it'd be useful to just talk a little bit about my own career and journey and, and experience of them. So I became a consultant back in 2001. Uh, and at that point, you couldn't apply for clinical excellence uh, uh, awards for the first few years of becoming a consultant, which I think actually was quite a good thing. So I just threw myself into clinical work and developing um, a lot of uh, sort of educational expertise uh, at the time. And the first year that I was um, eligible to uh, apply, I had absolutely no intention of doing so. It sounded to me like a a bit of smoke and mirrors and uh, something I didn't particularly understand and um, not huge amounts of, 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 of money at the, at the time I thought well you know after I've sort of spent a weekend applying for that and you know tax and, 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 and so on and the chances of getting up fairly slim anyway I was sort of not inclined to apply but it was a colleague who uh, encouraged me and very much like Trudy said at the beginning you've got to be in it to win it and I said well the thing is if I don't get it, if I apply and don't get it I'm going to be really disappointed I'm you know and 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 they sort of didn't quite say you've got a man up but but sort of something along those lines really and, and sort of said well you know if you don't apply um you, you know you're never going to have a have a chance and actually these things add up over time and do make um, quite a big difference to uh, income so I was encouraged by my colleague and I had a go and I filled in my um, form um, really well. I actually quite enjoyed the discipline of uh, using the characters to their maximum and, and, and getting as much information as I, I could into the, the, the box and, and, and finally honing it until I had something that looked quite good. And I, I, I put it in for local awards and to my surprise was awarded one. And then over the next five years, um, got into the swing of putting an application and I was you know very fortunate I was awarded in total six local awards over five year um, period so I had um, uh, uh, you know, done really very well but the next year I had a very difficult experience um, at work I've moved to a different part of my uh, organization and I kind of really tell this story to try and encourage people and uh, give you some motivation to keep going with it. I'm very glad that this experience didn't happen to me in the first few years of consultant life because I think my career could have looked very different. But I had an internal transfer within my organisation and went to work for a ward that was really failing. I knew there were development needs when I went there, but I hadn't really been quite aware of just how big those development needs uh, were and I, I was there for 15 months before I eventually um, raised concerns about the unit I worked on and it was closed within a week um, and during that time I looked back and I worked probably the hardest I've ever worked in my uh, career I put my soul heart and soul into everything I did and I did more um, audit more audits and quality improvement during that period of time and I think I've probably done in the rest of my my career, I worked really, really hard, but we closed the board. It wasn't exactly excellent. And so that year, my application, although it had lots of um, hard work on it, didn't have an awful lot around excellence. And my application was um, unsuccessful. I was really hurt. I think, you know, echoing what Nav was saying earlier, I really took it personally. And looking back, I shouldn't have done. But sadly, clinical excellence awards are for that. They're for clinical excellence, not clinical effort um, awards. And yes, it does feel really unfair. There are so many people, and, and, and some of you will be listening in, who are working in difficult services um, that are very far from where you'd want them to be, that are far from excellent. And it's unfair because it sometimes feels that it's a lot easier for um, uh, colleagues who might be working uh, in more fortunate services that might have new funding, for example, to set up new services, 
uh, it might be easier for colleagues who are working um, full time and, and, and sometimes you see applications and people are on you know, many more than, than 10 PAs and that all feels very uh, unfair and I, and I suppose some of my ambivalence about the whole thing comes from that. So I felt bruised and as a result I didn't apply for anything for five years, I just couldn't face it. But I still worked hard, I um, developed uh, my educational portfolio, built up my clinical uh, service, seizing every opportunity I could to make things um, better. I've never really been motivated uh, by money, I've been lucky enough throughout my life to feel that my income has been sufficient, but I am really motivated by fairness. So in 2016, I was elected Dean at the college. Um, and the interesting thing was that I spent a whole weekend of my spare time in that first year that I was uh, in office rating applications for national awards. And I kind of realized after, you know, um, plowing through a lot of them that I had contributed just as much as many of the people applying if not more, not only locally, uh, but nationally uh, too. And I was also um, acutely aware of the publicity around the gender pay gap and the work that um, Jane Dacre was starting um, to do. So I um, decided that really I ought to throw my hat in the ring um, the following uh, year. Um, and I applied both locally uh, and nationally, I was awarded two points locally, which took me up to eight points. And actually, I'd forgotten about the national uh, uh, award, but I got a nice letter uh, in the post some months later saying that I'd been uh, awarded um, a bronze um, award. The satisfaction of having your work recognised um, nationally and locally. Um, and there's something very nice about feeling that you are in there representing uh, the profession. The award, it doesn't feel like it's just for you. It feels like it's for the whole um, uh, profession. And I think that experience more than made up for my previous um, disappointment. So what have I learned? Well, first of all, have a go. These things are possible. Start early in your career. There'll be many people maybe listening in who are a way off from applying for a national award, but start early in your career, striving to make a clinical uh, impact. I found it very helpful to use the appraisal process to collect detailed information about my activities. Uh, and I've always kept an up-to-date CV. And again, I'd really recommend that. It's good to be able to look back and quickly summarize what you've been up to in that year. I have always set aside a whole weekend to do the application form. They do take a long um, uh, amount of time um, getting all the data together and then finally honing uh, your submission and give very clear examples of activity. So um, like you would at an interview, use a model like the SOAR technique. So what was the situation? What was your objective? What was the action? And importantly, what was the result? So you use data. Um, and, uh, you know, look at um, uh, being able to describe what you actually achieved. Um, and it's helpful, I think, to look at other people's applications, find a trusted colleague who will share their application. And very often HR um, departments in trust will, will um, have some exemplars that they'll share with you. Um, as Nav said, you know, think about who your audience is, what your message is. Um, and you don't need to be at the top of your local awards um, scheme to be successful in national awards. So if you think that you've done lots of um, stuff and you're contributing nationally, have a go and um, fill in all the boxes. If there's nothing in the box, um, you know, you won't get any points at all and stick within the uh, word count. I think Nav's um, advice about, um, you know, um, expecting to fail is probably really helpful. Um, I sometimes talk about going for no um, and, and, and just assuming that, you know, you, you have to keep knocking at the door and, until somebody uh, eventually uh, answers it until you're successful. And finally, say it loud and say it proud. It's likely to go against the grain if you're anything like me. Um, you know, you probably um, feel that this is, um, you know, against everything that you were ever brought up to believe in or do. But if you don't say it, um, then who else is going to blow your trumpet? So say it loud and say it proud and good luck. And I'm going to hand back to Trudy.
That was brilliant, Kate. Thank you. So say it loud and say it proud. So let's hold on to, to that and uh, just millions of nuggets of advice all the way through that. So thank you so much. So, so everyone in the audience, please hold on to all of this and I can see more questions being posted. So please keep posting uh, as we move on to our third speaker. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted to introduce uh, Professor Ashok Roy, who, who I know is not even working today. So thank you, Ashok, for joining us. Uh, Ashok is a, a consultant psychiatrist for adults with a learning disability in the West Midlands uh, and is providing community and specialist inpatient services. He is, of course, the immediate past chair of the intellectual disability faculty at the college and is a clinical advisor for ID and Autism for Health Education England. So Ashok, over to you um, for you to share your words of wisdom too. Thank you. Yes, I'm coming to you from sunny Western Supermare. Firstly, thank you very much for uh, Trudy for inviting me to share my experience of the clinical impact system. So my, my it's mainly, um, You've heard a few really important points from Nav and from Kate, and I'll just share some of my own perspectives. So my initial perception was that the system was limited to a privileged few. That is what my seniors told me. Um, and that's what they felt that they didn't need to engage because it wouldn't help them. Anyway, uh, in the nineties, uh, the, the 1990s, a lo the local award system was created, which at least made the whole system more accessible and people took local ownership. But it took years for people to overcome apathy and sort of learned helplessness and to regain the motivation to apply. Um, I mean, local systems were interesting. They gave great weight, greater weightage to clinical activity and that kind of made things a bit more spent a weekend filling in and did a, doing some paperwork that would net them 20, 30 or 40,000 pounds over their lifetime, would they do that? And I said, that's what it comes down to, the financial benefit of applying for these things and being successful. So the recent trends that I, I see that the numbers had been drastically reduced recently, but they have now doubled this year. But I think that's just coming back to what it was before but still very, very competitive. I think I've noticed that uh, the awards uh, tend to focus on certain periods, uh, say a five-year period or something like that. So people need to, people sometimes ignore that and start quoting history of their early life uh, in a job or not giving enough time for uh, things that they have started to actually have an impact. I think I also remember having a lot of content in the forms about people being in august bodies and committees and all that at very high levels. But what has become increasingly obvious is the so what question. I did this, so what? What impact did it have? Uh, so people now have expecting, say for psychiatrists to have uh, some impact on their service Say, for example, I reduced waiting times from 84 days to 40 days, or reduced um, the incidence of physical interventions from 20 a month to four a month, or patient satisfaction from X to Y. But the problem, as, as NAV has already said, is that there isn't an awful lot of data, especially peer-reviewed national data, to actually use to say that you are better or worse than something. So it's quite a challenge. But that doesn't mean that one doesn't uh, doesn't uh, use what data there is and what data you can get hold of. I think uh, what I want to actually focus on are uh, what people would regard as my own messages to potential applicants. Now, I'm, there are a staggering number of people at this webinar, which is really shows how interesting this topic is for many people. But sometimes I think that people need to prepare before they actually launch into an application so that they cover their domains properly. Because I've seen some amazing applications in say three domains or four domains and a zero uh, in a fifth domain. 
which makes their application almost dead in the water. So what is the message is? The, the system has worked hard and this latest iteration is no exception to make it more open and more fair um, to allocate regardless of gender or ethnicity. And I think if, of course, there are, that is carefully monitored by the committee and we'll see if this is gonna work or not. Psychiatry is poorly represented amongst uh, successful awardees. It is a, actually a, a disgrace how few psychiatrists actually get awards compared to the acute specialties. And that goes back to uh, Nav's point and uh, earlier that the audience doesn't understand esoteric psychiatric short forms and, 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 and uh, jargon. And I think that is why uh, it doesn't, they don't resonate with psychiatry applications unless it's very carefully put together. Um, I think the other thing is that the, you, you can see that the domains now cover leadership, research, education, additional national impact, which means that one has to start thinking of one's career and one's activity in a fairly broad-based fashion. There's no point just saying, I'm here to see patients and nothing else, because that isn't really what a consultant's job is about solely. So I, I used to tell my uh, colleagues that, can you at least try and publish one paper a year to start with or present in one major conference a year? So it builds up a track record and builds up momentum and builds up a broader perspective. There are many opportunities uh, uh, now for people in the NHS to work with local universities, just have developed good infrastructure to support research activities. So there's no excuse not to do something Again, you, I think it, it's important to use local leadership skills to develop skills and stamina. I think I find that um, there's an old adage, isn't there? If you want to give, get it done, give it to the busiest person, it'll get done. And that's because the busiest person has got the stamina and the, the survival skills to do multitasking, um, unlike other people who haven't done that, who regard themselves as being... Uh, under pressure and therefore can't take on additional work. So I think local leadership activity is really important to start off and gives an idea of how complex teamwork can be and can give perspectives um, which are local, regional and national. And the reason why I'm saying that is that if you get fed up of something in your own trust, you can spend a few, a bit of energy doing something outside the trust to kind of bring balance back to your, um, uh, to your life. Otherwise, there's a very risky outcome, which is that one gets uh, burnt out and uh, exhausted. And I think that this is one of the reasons why I have always felt important to engage with the clinical impact system is it encourages consultants to provide a more rounded uh, contribution to the NHS than simply focusing on one part at the cost of something else. So, I think that the clinical impact uh, process develops strategies for us that deal with stress and burnout and make for a more fulfilling career. So I think it's to engage now and enrich professional life and build resilience, the rewards are considerable. And that's really all I want to say, Trudy. Thank you very much for inviting me. Again, Ashok, um, that was really wonderful to listen to. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing all of those thoughts uh, and experiences with us. Um, so could I, on that, uh, invite everybody back onto this, the screen or our stage, um, <clears throat> our Clinical Impact Award stage? Um, and Nava, I can see that you've been very dutifully going through all the questions and answering them, which is... Uh, which has been really fantastic. I might just pick up on some of them actually for our for our discussion, just for, um, it will be helpful for us to discuss a little bit further as a group. Um, so please do keep posting questions. Um, let me just go back, there's a, is that a one new question? I think that was, that was an ongoing conversation, I think that Andrew first raised, um, I'm not sure that we fully answered that for you. Um, so this was about 
the rules for renewal um, for older awards and their onward pensionability. I think, Nav, have you answered that? There may be some people in the audience who have got older awards and are worried about their pensionability um, and what that means in terms of future rounds. And a worry really that this might result in early retirement to, to protect existing pensionable awards. Yeah, if I can just say a few words about that, Trudy, it's, um, it's uh, I'll declare my own conflict there. I'm a silver award holder and I was really concerned about that one. Um, as Kate has said, it's not the money that matters, but I've always found that once the money's in your wallet, you, you don't like it flying out too easily. Um, if you've never had it in your wallet, then you don't get so worried about it. And as I'm going to be, I've got mental health office status, I was concerned that in the years leading up to potentially retiring uh, with mental health office status, it could really have a massive impact on me. And I know it has an impact on others in my situation, but they were very clear. As long as you apply for an award and are successful, and it doesn't matter whether it's level one, two or three, the existing amount that you've been awarded, whether it's bronze, silver, gold, or if you're lucky enough to have a platinum, that is protected for at least five years at that level, at least at that level, and it will be pensionable. But after that, that's it. it you'll be in the new scheme. It will be with the new award levels, no pensionability. So as one of our colleagues has asked already, will that affect early retirement? Almost certainly. Um, uh, again, we've had problems in mental health for a long time about early retirement with mental health of the status, burnout, etc. The national leaders have taken all that into account across all the different specialities have said that regardless of the potential impact, the cost is so much there has to be a way of limiting the cost, but actually increasing the number of total awards so that, for example, women, uh, ethnic minorities, part-time workers get a better chance of getting an award. And actually, if you think of those as laudable aims, I think that's a good trade-off. That's great, Nav, thank you. Um, I can't see any more questions around that. So I think there was another one actually um, from Andrew, which was about being awarded a two-year bronze award at the previous round. Um, and, and he appealed because it was uh, only for two years. And I can see now you've responded and said, actually the awards are given for five years. And at the end of uh, four years, people are asked to, to renew that application. Um, and just picking up the conversation in the question, um, he's saying that they said this was because I had changed my job plans in the year prior to my application, and that was within the rules. However, I read all the documents and could see nothing anywhere saying that two years awards were possible. But they say there's no further appeal. So, really, can I respond to that one? Yes, please. Yes, so we'll come I'll, back I'll, to I'll start. Again. I'll start uh, with, with the usual coward's caveat. You know, um, I can the, the advice I'm going to give or the opinions I'm going to give are my own, and they are the opinions of a fool, and therefore must not be taken seriously or as legal advice. The first thing is, in general, if people appeal, uh, my experience is that the appeal process is very open, very transparent. I've been involved in a number of appeals processes. Uh, different people, both lay and professionals, look at it, and I've very rarely, if ever, seen something that is worth supporting in terms of an appeal process. That doesn't mean that in this particular case, that same general opinion applies, Andrew. Forgive me for that one if that's how it sounded. But the appeals process is very fair, and I don't think there is anything then to be concerned about in terms of appeals. If colleagues want to appeal, by all means do so. But don't feel bad if the appeals process support what you um, feel strongly about. That's the general view about appeals. Second, in this case, Andrew, I think it's quite a specific case. And given that it may not have general applicability, I'm very happy that if you contact me outside of this, I can start a dialogue with you. Again, I, I have to be very careful because I'm conflicted because of my national role but I can certainly give you general advice and comment about where that particular situation may have perhaps uh, um, uh, proved to be difficult for the National Committee to, to sort of um, give an opinion on. 
So if that's okay, there's been a bit of a cheeky coward's answer there at the end, but I think it is very detailed. I've not come across anything like this in 12 years. That's great, uh, Nav, thank you. Um, just moving on to some other questions, which I, I know there have been some answers, but perhaps just uh, um, some simple ones around these are, these are for England and Wales, so not for Scotland, unfortunately. Um, what if you're changing um, posts between sort of a substantive post and a locum role? So um, the response there being that it, actually at the point of starting that, if you're in a substantive role, then that's okay. And that's my understanding of it. Um, so it's a, as long as you're in a substantive at the, the point that you're starting the application, you may well move into a locum job later on. That should be okay. That's absolutely okay, and you could have had locum periods of work in between as well, Trudy. The important thing is, when when they say you need to be eligible on that day or covering that time period, if you were eligible at that point, that's the only thing that matters. You could have been doing locum work for four years for an agency, then just done one year as in a substantive job. As long as you are ticking all the other boxes, that's absolutely fine. You have to produce a phenomenal amount of work in that one year to be uh, stand a chance of getting an award, but you'll be surprised. I've marked applications for consultants who've been in post, not psychiatrists, I, I, I grant you on that one, uh, who've been in an acute hospital for no more than two or three years, who've produced work that is of international calibre. And they've got a national award just based on a few years without even any local clinical excellence awards. Extremely rare, but it can happen. That's lovely enough, thank you. And Ashok, just one, one for you perhaps um, as well. You, you talked about the different domains and sort of not scoring a zero in one of them because that's a sort of an own goal really, isn't it? If, if there's a zero in one of them. So if, if, you, if somebody feels they're out there strong in maybe a couple of domains, but not in the others, is it worth applying? And you know, well, it's, and what do uh, people do, think... what would you advise? I, I think this is the reason why I was saying that one has to look at those domains and in a way, they are the clues as to what one has to invest time and energy on. Because even if you get very high scores, it's such a, such a competitive process that getting a low score in one domain immediately rules you out um, because there'll be others who are not doing that. So it's a competition. And that's why I think it's important to think about these different uh, roles, leadership uh, roles, research, education, um, uh, and all that in the round so that one has got, and I think it's not just do one thing and stop, but just gradually keep building so that your applications get stronger over the years. Because uh, if your career comes to a halt, people notice that because they said about well, the previous application said the same thing. Uh, and I think there's a risk of that happening. The committees are really, really good at making sense of what is presented to them extremely uh, sharp they are. That's why it's important to be really all-rounded from the beginning. Thanks, Ashok. And something for people to know is that actually people will go back and committees will go back and read um, applicants who perhaps have um, applied previously just to compare and contrast new information from uh, previous applications. So that can happen, can't it? Yes. Hey, can I just extend that question to you? Because you also talked uh, about building a portfolio. What else, what else can people do to sort of build their portfolio over time and years to get ready for these awards? Because now that they're here, they'll be here hopefully for some time. Yeah, well, I mean, I think um, Ashok's um, advice is really good and, and, you know, having, you know, so, so for, for people who are in the process of applying for um, awards, I think we need to demystify the process. Um, I think there's nothing to, um, to stop uh, senior psychiatrists having these conversations with their trainees, um, you know, along the way. How else do you find out about uh, about them certainly you know at ST sort of you know five six level I think being aware of the process and the different domains um, for trainees and newly appointed consultants people you know um, hoping at the start well um, uh, stuff covers some of this but you know newly appointed consultants 
seeking out information, just having a look at the form and thinking, you know, how could I fill this in in five years time? You know, I might be really strong on educational aspects, but I haven't got an awful lot to put in the research uh, box. Can I get involved perhaps in some educational research and, and uh, you know, um, uh, allied with where my, my sort of strong interests uh, lie? But, but I think, yeah, planning ahead is, is, is good. But I'd also say, just a caveat with that, um, never ever do anything because you think it's going to lead to clinical excellence um, awards. I've seen far too many people um, do stuff because they think it's going to look good on their CV. And my experience is that that's, you know, well, it's sad because life is too short, um, really, but it also quite often ends in disappointment. Do stuff because you love doing it and because you want to make a difference would be my advice. If a happy side effect is that you um, develop clinical, um, clinically excellent services uh, and, and so on, and somebody somewhere recognises it, you for it all well and good but never do anything because you think it's going to be at points on the, on, on the form sometime in the distant future. Thanks Kate that's really great advice. Um, so just a few more questions that have appeared then on average how many psychiatrists get national awards each year? I don't have an exact number to hand but I know it's very very few I don't think. Do any of you know the exact numbers but I don't I don't have any numbers, Trudy, other than just to say that we are um, underrepresented. The annual the reports uh, provide that. The, the annual reports provide the breakdown of specialties. You can actually work it out. But that is, uh, the numbers are small considering how the size of our specialty. I don't know whether you agree with that now. I think psychiatry is underrepresented. It, it absolutely just say, yeah. is, yeah. Ashok is absolutely right. The, the data is published on an annual basis in the national report. So if you go to the um, ACIA website, A-C-C-E-A -E website, you can look at the national report and it gives you a good breakdown. Surprisingly, psychiatrists do reasonably, actually. It's just that we don't apply in enough numbers. I think that's the major downside. There are just some professions that don't feel that they, they think the CAs or the CIAs are for them. And that's absolutely not the case we stand at least as good a chance as, for example, radiology or as pathology, and we should be putting our names forward uh, in, in appropriate numbers. Thanks. Thank you. So just if you uh, just picking up on some other points people are raising, what about private work? Does that count? No, it doesn't count. However, there's a way you can sneakily get around that, in my opinion. This is, this is all about NHS impact. But if you can demonstrate that your private work is having a meaningful difference to the community or to, for example, um, public health protection, in effect, if you let me give you an example, let's have you, you say you're in your private life, you work as a public health communicator. If you can say you're reducing down the level of Ill, mental ill health in the in, the, in our communities on a regional level or national level because maybe a, a company you run and that will reduce the impact of people going on to develop a disorder for the NHS that way you could put that in to domain five in my opinion because you're reducing down the number of people who would eventually end up with a disorder that goes to the NHS so it depends on how you phrase it you do have to be a bit sneaky but um, in effect you can't usually use private work no Thank you for that. I can see we've only got a minute left of, of time. So lots of questions, everyone. Thank you. How many college applications, how many applications does the college usually support? I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but it is a significant number. Um, and they are meticulously scored within the college process. Um, it is a, is it, it's a sizable number, but I don't, apology, have the exact number to hand. Ah, oh, so that someone might be typing, no, Devon is typing the answer, hopefully. So Devon, Devon, Devon who is helping with the webinars, is, uh, knows the information, hopefully. Well, look, we've hit, um, we've hit the hour. So I think we have to, so Devon has said it's 30% success rate for psychiatrists in 2019-20 and comparable with other specialties. Oh, oh, no, Kate, that was you. That was for overall, wasn't it? Thank you. 
Listen, we've hit five o'clock, so I know we're going to um, have to end now, but that's been absolutely fantastic. So can I just thank um, Nav and Ashok and Kate for joining us? I hope that was useful. Please, the college is here to help you with, help you with your application process. So do come and ask. Uh, you've got colleagues locally. Uh, it'd be really good for you to nudge each other in the process and uh, we hope this, this has been a really helpful webinar for you so thank you thank you